Well, hello everyone. It's Martin Lush here from NSF Health Sciences. Welcome to uh, the first of our free webinars for 2018. I almost said 2017 then. Um, uh, a timely uh, webinar because it's a pretty, uh, pretty challenging title there, ladies and gentlemen, the political landscape and the future of the pharmaceutical industry, uh, all in 30 minutes. So hang on, folks, because you're going to feel like those two people on the front there, this is going to be fast and furious, but hopefully stimulating. My objective is really to, to get you to think more than the routine, think beyond the here and now, uh, just to take a, a glance into the, 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 the future and to actually assess uh, the, the impact of it. As, as always, these are going to be short and sharp, they're 30 minutes long. Uh, they're going to be recorded, and I'd re really encourage you, everyone, to share these recordings with your colleagues. Because we, you know, we all have a vested interest in, in, in having jobs and professions that are fulfilling as well as long-lasting, and that's all fine. Um, providing we adapt to the challenges that, that lay ahead. So please feel free to uh, circulate these. Uh, and if you do have any questions, and I'd really be surprised if, if, if I don't, then please email me on that address and I'll get back to you straight away. And any feedback, uh, obviously, uh, really, really important for me. Um, and I also, as many of you know, uh, write a lot of about this on LinkedIn. So there's the invitation there to follow me more on LinkedIn. So. Uh, we're already into that 30 minutes, and what's really fascinating, I find, about um, where we are now to where we've been before is that the world is a completely different place in the sense that three things are all accelerating at exactly the same time and all accelerating very, very quickly. Uh, global warming, globalization, and science and technology. Uh, any one of these, any two of these accelerating at any one time is challenging, but when they're all accelerating all at the same time and getting faster and faster, that means that each one of us is going to have, it will, will be impacted in one way or the other. And what I want to do is to give you an insight, certainly from my opinion, and it is just my opinion, none of this is precise as you can well imagine, um, because uh, you know, I think this is really, really important. Now, I do know also, and I've been in the pharmaceutical industry for almost 40 years, uh, in pharma there is that belief that, hey, yeah, what, whatever is happening on the external environment always takes time before it filters down into the pharmaceutical world. There's this magical, mythical 20-year rule. In other words, it takes 20 years from bench to bedside. Um, but the environment has changed, and I actually don't think that that 20-year rule will be tolerated, principally because we've got 7.5 billion people that need looking after globally, and that number is increasing. So the world has changed, and the needs of our population is changing. I read an interesting statistic, a frightening statistic the other day, that within 12 years, 70% of the world will be obese, 70%. So this notion of taking 20 years to fix that problem, 20 years to fix diabetes, 20 years to fix cancers, the list goes on, I think actually is wrong. Um, we have to do better as an industry. Um, none of these statistics, none of these numbers, I think will surprise you. Um, you know, it takes us 20 years to bring a new chemical entity to market at a cost of $1.3 billion. Uh, we have uh, an 80 to 90 percent failure rate. And if you look at just the last five years, we've had $240 billion of failure at phase two and phase three clinical trials. So against that backdrop of an aging population and governments that can no longer afford to treat that population, with this level of inefficiency, clearly there is a very, very big uh, difference. And really what I want to do, ladies and gentlemen, is to, you know, to get you thinking beyond what you do routinely um, so that we're actually confident that we're not heading towards 
potential um, disaster and they were actually planning for the future rather than for a world that no longer, no longer exists. Because in any industry, failure looks like this when, you're, when your productivity, when your prices go down and your costs go up. Um, that is not a healthy picture. And that is the picture for pharmaceuticals. You know, our costs are going up um, and our prices are coming down. I think it's fair to say that a, a lot of pharmaceutical companies make their profits from niche products. But that's not a sustainable model, so things have to change. Now, one of the things is for sure is that for all of us in, in pharmaceuticals and in healthcare in general in the next decade or so, um, and that time will fly. Ten years sounds a long time, but actually it's going to go very, very quickly. The great thing is I actually think it's a, probably the most exciting time to be associated with the healthcare industry because it sure ain't going to be dull. Uh, and I think many of us are going to, are going to feel like um, particularly that guy on the right-hand side there. So it's going to be fun, it's going to be exciting, it's going to be challenging because the healthcare industry is really ripe for disruption. And we're going to talk later about the role of um, the, uh, the, the, the big tech companies, whether, they, whether it be Amazon, whether it be Google, whether it be Microsoft. These are players that recognize uh, that this is an industry that is ripe for disruption. And if we work together, we can achieve great things. Um, you know, I'm an opp opportunist, I like to think, and I actually think these kind, kinds of challenges are, are really opportunities. I, you know, I actually think we have unprecedented opportunities, providing we do things differently. Uh, I also believe that if we don't act, we will be acted upon. Um, I also believe that we have to shape the future rather than prepare for it. And I also believe that unless we collaborate, we won't make it. Um, whether it be in the sphere, field of robotics and artificial intelligence, big data and small data, harmonization, and changing our business model completely uh, is going to be very, very challenging to meet the needs of the growing population. Now, collaboration is an easy word. When you look at all of the various titles in papers these days and at conferences, I think if I had a dollar for every time the word collaboration was mentioned, I think I'd be a very rich man. Unfortunately, it's not something our industry does very well. It's not something individual companies do well. I mean, many of you can reflect on the silos within your own businesses, and collaboration is not something we are good at, yet it will be essential to our very, very future. Now, what, one of the, uh, and, you know, when I proposed this title, ladies and gentlemen, for a webinar, one of my colleagues said, are you kidding? How, how on earth can you, can you cover anything that is meaningful in 30 minutes? Now, one of my objectives really, ladies and gentlemen, is just to help you understand more so that you may fear less. And, and really that is my primary objective, is to get you thinking more and to actually spread the message and to actually encourage you to read more and understand better. Uh, because this will not work. This is actually a very high strategy. Because there are so many people that I meet, often at very senior levels within the industry, as well as its regulators, who take a position of, look, let's just wait and see. Let's just wait and see what happens, and then we'll adapt accordingly. That won't work. It's high risk. Um, what adds to our you know, interest is the volatility within the world. I mean, two of these you could have predicted, but who on earth would have predicted Leicester City winning the Premiership League in 2015 and 2016. We actually live, and this is now a dictionary term, ladies and gentlemen, we live in a VUCA world, a world that is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. This is now the new norm, and this means our mindsets have to change to adapt to this, um, as indeed do our systems um, that so far have stood the test of time, but now need to be radically changed if we're going to meet the needs in this new world. Uh, but, you know, there are, there are certain elephants in the room, so to speak. Uh, in other words, there are certain things we have to accept as dead certs, as, uh, as, as we say. 
you know, first and foremost, our industry, whether we like it or not, is not trusted uh, because of lack of transparency. Whether we agree or not, governments want to focus on prevention over treatment. Governments cannot afford to treat an aging population. We have to focus on prevention. Um, there's going to be far greater patient ownership, primarily uh, you know, a facility given to us by or provided by uh, the likes of Apple through wearable technology, where we have so much data available to us that allows medical and healthcare pro professionals to make very, very, very early interventions to stop people getting into hospital, to stop people getting into treatment programs. Um, we're rapidly moving to a no benefit, no payment model. Um, we've got to be very uh, accepting of the impact of the tech giants, as they, they, they're, they're called, the Apples, the Googles, the Amazons, the Facebooks, who, as we'll see later, have the understanding and the technologies and the infrastructure needed that pharma do not, which is why collaboration is going to be so key. Unfortunately, in the pharma industry, um, we, have a, we have the fear of, anything new you know we do have a natural inbuilt risk aversion um, that is something that we're going to have to move away from to being risk smart because in amongst all of this VUCA turbulence we're going to have to take risks these are not gambles these are risks that are very carefully thought through because of we recognize the need to change but you know one of our biggest challenges is actually the pace of change in healthcare is currently faster than our ability to understand its impact and certainly faster than the regulatory standards and framework. And you know, when I share this with colleagues and, and, and people in industry, when I share with them my thoughts on the impact of Google and the impact of Amazon and the impact of artificial intelligence and research and development, the one response I commonly get is, yes, but, Martin, what about the regulatory agencies? What about the regulatory requirements? And as we'll see later, that is the case, but the pressure is building to such an extent that I can actually foresee rapid acceleration or faster acceleration in the way the regulatory framework is changing. You know, we know that the FDA, to their credit, has already set up a separate group within FDA to look at the role of in software development um, in, in the way that that can be applied, particularly in the research and development arena. So FDA have recognized the need to, to, to look to the future rather than assume that the framework and regulations of the past will be sufficient for the needs of the future, when in reality they will not. One thing is clear is whether it's genomics, whether it's uh, robotics, whether it's artificial intelligence, and or big data, these are already having a profound impact on our daily lives. Uh, you may not know it, but they do. Um, but they're also going to have a massive effect in the future, as we will see as we go through this session. Because with algorithms, with artificial intelligence, with machine learning, with deep learning, the, you know, one plus one can equal a thousand. In other words, the rate of change can be accelerated to a level that we've never ever seen before, but nonetheless, nonetheless a level that is required in order to meet future healthcare needs. Um, and one of the requirements, one of the challenges um, is, look, we need executives, we need leadership, many of you, to be understanding what I call savvy when it comes to artificial intelligence, robotics, machine learning, deep learning, and so on. Just so that we understand more, so we can spot the opportunities and that we can fear less. Because, you know, if you don't know where you're going, you're going to end up somewhere else. Now, you're talking to somebody here, ladies and gentlemen, who has to phone his son up at university in order to operate the Sky Channel on TV, you know? I'm of that generation of, you know, I can use a computer, I can use a laptop, I'm not an IT geek, 
But I do understand the importance of being aware so that we know the direction in which we're going. Um, and there's a lot of information. If any of you want really readable references on deep learning, machine learning, artificial intelligence, just let me know because I'm currently piling my way through these because I actually think it's really important. I think it's important as a professional in the advice that I give my clients, but also I think it's important for all of us as, uh, as parents to be uh, AI savvy, not expert, but certainly understanding of the challenges and understanding of the opportunities. You know, I've got two, two, uh, two at university, which is why I don't have much money, um, so I have a vested interest, and indeed many of you do, in understanding the world that our kids are going to be employed within. Some interesting and some frightening statistics here. And I know I'm going off the subject a little, but I think this will interest many of you, is that 65% of current school students will be doing jobs that currently don't exist. Did you realize that 80% of current university students are doing degrees for which there are no jobs, and that eight to nine completely different careers for these students would actually be the norm. And this is really you know, critical for us as an industry and critical for us as, as parents because the impact will be pretty profound and significant, but if we're prepared for it, then uh, you know we can leverage that to the best of our uh, you know to, to the and get get the opportunity from it. You know there are different types of jobs. There are manual repetitive jobs. There are non uh, repetitive manual jobs. There are cognitive repetitive jobs, and there are non repetitive uh, cognitive jobs. The point here is that anything that is predictable can and probably will be automated. And we're already seeing that. We've seen that in the financial sector. We're seeing it in pharmacy. We're seeing it in law. But also, interestingly, is that those non-repetitive, those non-predictable jobs are also at risk because of machine learning. You know, this notion that computers are always programmable is, is a myth because now with deep learning and machine learning, um, uh, these these uh, computers are now teaching themselves, which means that many of uh, jobs that were previously considered safe are now actually exposed to artificial intelligence and robotics. So, you know, this this really is an opportunity. We have to, we have uh, two choices um, as parents. Two choices as professionals, we can either bury our head in the sand and believe that that 20-year rule will apply, um, or we can actually um, think about this differently, think about this opportunity for giving us new thinking, new possibilities as a result of embracing that new technology. And, and I actually feel that in, in times of rapid change, it's in those times that we actually get those light bulb moments. So, you know, we've got to avoid complacency, and the pharmaceutical industry, I think, has historically been um, complacent. We've got to embrace reality. For, for many of us, we've got to avoid that institutional blindness um, that the environment often creates. We've got to focus on the short term, uh, sorry, on the long term, not the short term, even if profits are impacted as a result. That collaborative word comes in here because we've got to do it like never before, particularly with patients and particularly with payers, as well as the, the, the uh, tech giants that will, plop, will provide the skills and technology that we actually need. But also, and I want to give you some practical tools and techniques to take away that you can apply, because arguably some of this you'll be sat there thinking, yeah, but we have no influence over that, Martin. But certainly there are things that we can focus on, uh, and that is making sure that we individually as well as institutionally do the basics exceptionally well, if you like, to PhD level. Now, if you look at sports, any one of these characters and more, one thing that separates them from the rest is that they do the basics better than anyone else. Now, in amongst this VUCA world with all of these different players coming in, 
it's important to actually prepare ourselves as individuals as well as those around us and our wider organization by saying, look, we can't do everything, but we've got to focus on certain things that are fundamentally critical to our very survival. And in my opinion, if you do these five, five things to PhD level, in other words, exceptionally, exceptionally well, we're going to be far better positioned as an industry, far better positioned as individuals, far better positioned as companies to actually grasp the incredible opportunities that there are out there. Um, education and recruitment, risk management, change management, problem solving, and simplification. Now, many of you have heard me talk on these before. Um, many of you will have listen to the webinars before and I've covered all of these, if not during the webinar, certainly on my LinkedIn posts. So none of this is a surprise, but still is not being perfect, not, not being practiced, let alone perfected to uh, PhD standards by I would say 90% plus of pharmaceutical companies that I go to. So just to give you a flavor of three of them, because we don't have time for all of them. You know, there's a difference between training and education. You know, NSF, we, we, we really work hard to educate our clients, educate those that are coming on our courses, educating those that we consult with, because in the process of education, you change the way people think. However, you know, training is completely different. You know, you train your pets, you educate your children. And as an industry, we still train, we don't educate. So to be prepared for this VUCA world, we really have to educate and invest in education. Now, if you understand the 10, 20, 70 model, you're doing very, very well. You're on the education path. Um, if you understand the BMAS model, that behavior is impacted by motivation, ability, the trigger event, and the habit, and you build that into your education processes and systems, you are educating, not training. If you are familiar with Jenna and Claxton and Marshall and Halpern and Buzan and De Bono, you're already well along the way to having a program of educating your people rather than training them. If all of this is new to you and none of these names are familiar, and you're not immersed in what they propose, you're stuck in the training, and you have to change that very, very quickly. Um, because we have to recognize that we have to make met people before we make medicines. And in this volatile, uncertain world, the better qualified our people are as thinkers, the better, the more adaptable they are to the change of the, that inevitably will, will be coming their way. And education, whether it be in emotional intelligence, uh, uh, passion for learning, uh, recruiting people that challenge the rules, recruiting people from completely different un uh, industries, recruiting people with completely different backgrounds is really going to be key to our very survival and prosperity. So doing the basics to PhD level is really, really key. And that starts with how we educate our people in the way that I described. Also, for those of you that are leaders of people, managers of people, if you're a control freak, you're in for a very rough time. And I don't mean that in a dis disrespectful way. But leadership in the future is going to look very, very different to leadership of the past. I'm sure many of you practice that, uh, that leadership styles of providing autonomy, mentorship, guidance. There are still that, those that do not, um, and there's a really useful reference there that I found very useful in actually providing the guidance for, for leaders of the future in an industry that is going to be looking and feeling very different and one that requires very different leadership skills. Um, another area that we need to do to PhD level is our approach to risk uh, and our risk maturity. And, you know, this is acknowledging that our industry is risk averse. After all, mistakes can cost lives. But I actually think it's gone too far. It's gone way, way too far. I'll just use an illustration here. You know, 
What is it? If, if you were to consume either, uh, you know, one of these biscuits or a tablets, which is at greater risk of microbial contamination? Arguably, the biscuit provides that greater risk. You know, there's bigger volume there. I mean, both of these are low risk. But nonetheless, consuming, you know, a contaminated uh, biscuit is going to put you at greater risk. Now, I use this as an example because, you know, I'm aghast that the money wasted um, in pharmaceutical companies on the environmental monitoring and control of tablets, dry products that are very, very low risk. And, and that kind of risk-averse decision and the associated costs that come with it that we can no longer afford are catalyzed by this risk-averse mindset where we stop thinking. We actually don't make a balanced view as to what really, really is sensible risk and what is not. And in my opinion, that needs to stop. We can't afford it. And particularly in this environment where we're embarking on new collaborations and doing things completely new, we're going to have to be very, very risk savvy, very, very risk mature. And I've written about this in, in one of my posts, uh, which I'll direct you to, uh, because it really is one of those basics on top of education that we need to do to PhD level. Another thing we need to do to PhD level is how we solve problems. You know, I'm really, you know, you know we, we still have too many repeat errors uh, uh, and repeat deviations. Our attitude to problems uh, is still rudimentary. Instead of looking at problems as catalysts for continuous improvement, instead of looking at deviations as, as free lessons in what really don't, doesn't work, uh, we still consider them to be negative and inconvenient and to be fixed quickly rather than properly. You know, we still focus on CAPA, corrective action, preventive action, rather than PACA, preventive action over corrective action. We still focus more on reaction than prevention. And, you know, all of these here are examples of um, inventions, creations that came from mistakes. So the third of our skills that we need to do to PhD level is how we go about not just the mechanics of solving problems, but our attitude to problems. We've got to learn to fail fast. Um, another area that we need to do to PhD level, ladies and gentlemen, is, well, just a, I, love, I love this quote before we go on to simplification from Henry Ford, you know, failure is simply the opportunity to begin again, this time more intelligently. Um, the other area, one last area that I want to focus on is how we simplify. In order to really survive and prosper in this VUCA world, we need simple everything because less is more. Because the more complexity we have, uh, the less effective things become. The more we simplify, the more effective they become. And frankly, the cost of complexity is staggering, it's unaffordable, and it actually creates a barrier to all of the types of changes and innovation that we're going to need in order to really prosper in, in the future. Now, I know some complexity is natural, uh, but I would say a good 90% of complexity in the pharmaceutical industry is actually a choice. And the job of leadership is to create a frictionless environment, ladies and gentlemen, that allows people to do their job so much easier and frictionless because that speed is going to be critical as we move forward. Um, and yet, you know, 99.9% .9 of SOPs that I see in the industry uh, look like this and add no benefit whatsoever. They're written for the regulators rather than the users. So we're still document-driven. We're still compliance-driven, even though all of those compliance documents actually create more risk than they do anything else. And, you know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel when we come to simplification, which must be one of those core competencies done to PhD level. We just got to steal with pride. You know, people say to me, Martin, what are the solutions? And my, uh, my answer to that is look on Amazon. 
you know, just, just Google it because organizations and businesses have been there, done it, solved the problems. We just need to steal with pride. Now, question for you. How many shopping days to Christmas? Oh, my God, you're saying. We've only just got over the last one. Well, I've Googled this. Uh, according to Google today, there's 350 days to go. Uh, the point of this is, um, you know, if I was to write a wish list, a Dear Santa wish list for the pharmaceutical industry to make to, to allow it to flourish, and by flourish I mean to provide effective, high-quality medicines to a population in desperate need, these would be on my wish list. Dear Santa, can we have one harmonized GMP standard? You know, can we have early engagement of patients and providers and payers? Can we have patients sitting on our work committees? Can we have our patients walking the corridors of research and development? Um, can we have an Edison database? You know, Edison reputedly filled in 10,000 laboratory notebooks of failed experiments. He never called them failed experiments because he forensically analyzed them. Wouldn't it be great if everybody in there, whether they be preclinical or clinical failures, put those failures on the web for everybody to see, to learn from, and to leverage? That's true collaboration. Wouldn't it be great if we had an expiry date on all legislation? Unfortunately, some legislation, a lot of legislation, post-approval changes, for example, are actually killing innovation and actually preventing our industry from doing what it needs to do. Wouldn't it be great if we have mandatory unannounced inspections? I can just hear the sharp intake of breaths around the continent as all of you think, are you kidding? Well, we should be inspection ready, shouldn't we? So shouldn't the inspectors see the true rather than the prepared readiness of our plants? Um, wouldn't it be great if governments committed to 4% of GDP on life science and R&D because China is spending considerably more? Um, we've got to have an era of collaboration and, and, and partnership. We've got to have senior executives and leaders who really understand, not are expert in, but actually understand artificial intelligence and robotics and machine learning and deep learning so they can make informed decisions about what they need to do. And wouldn't it be great if we educate our children for the future rather than the past? And, you know, those education priorities, whether they be for um, you know, our children or for our industry has to focus on all of these, emotional intelligence, social intelligence. We want creative and innovative thinking. We want people who can think critically with great cognitive flexibility. We want our universities and schools and our institutions actually developing and generating people with a passion for lifelong learning because they're going to be relearning new skills and new professions more than they ever have done before. And we've got to be educating our people to make risk intelligent decisions. Now, extraordinary companies and people don't do extraordinary things. They just do ordinary things to an extraordinary level. So moving forward, ladies and gentlemen, in that future, Bearing in mind, many of you are sat there thinking, you know what, there's not a lot I can do to influence a lot of what you're saying, Martin. But these are things that you can influence. And the way you educate your people uh, in your risk maturity, the speed of your change management system. You know, if your change management system can't review and approve a change in 30 minutes, it is not fit for purpose. If your change management system is not rejecting 80% of changes put forward, it is not fit for purpose. Problem solving, simplification, all of these have to be practiced to PhD level and institutionalized throughout. And in anything we do, ladies and gentlemen, routinely, the question you must be asking yourself is, will this activity speed up innovation, improve patient access and compliance? Uh, do you realize that 50% of medicines are not taken as indicated? I find that shocking. I find that appalling. And that's something we have to fix. 
is what we are doing going to simplify and is it going to improve efficiency? And the answer is no to any of these. We should be stopped doing it. Now, just to bring things to a close, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is a picture of my, uh, my father-in-law who died three years ago, a remarkable man from a remarkable generation. He died at a ripe old age of 93, and the picture there is of him holding at that time my, I think she was two weeks old. She has uh, since turned into a uh, very wonderful 22-year-old, expensive but wonderful. Um, and the question I pose the industry is, you know, what worked for future generations? Will it work? What has worked for past generations? Will it work for future generations? And the model we currently have, the answer is no. We need to understand that. We need to embrace it, and we need to change. But this, I see, is an unprecedented opportunity. I think if we don't act, we will be acted upon. We will see Amazon, we will see Google taking a more profound uh, effect on our industry. And we must shape the future rather than prepare for it. We can't wait and see. We need to, to act. And without that collaboration in all of those areas, we won't make it. And that opportunity is there. In pharmaceuticals, we have that knowledge of the regulated environment and that, that, that healthcare industry. But we're not trusted. We still live in silos. We're still too slow. We're still risk averse. Apple and Google and their, 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 their partners are really, really cash rich. They have incredible consumer expertise and they're trusted. They have the knowledge of big data, they have the infrastructure, they have the wearable devices, they have excellent knowledge of the Internet of Things, but they don't have knowledge of the regulated environment. They can't make it without pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceuticals can't make it without, um, without them. So that collaboration is really, really going to be key. And sort of finishing off, ladies and gentlemen, you know, people say to me, and they sort of roll their eyes a little, and say, oh, yeah, okay, Martin, yeah, but, you know, this isn't going to happen. I actually think it will because there's a pressure cooker. The heat is being turned up. We have 7.5 billion people in need of treatment and not a lot of money to do it. So all of those changes will happen. It's a question of when rather than if. And hopefully in this session I've given you, and I, I truly believe that that collaboration, that great big idea comes from that collaboration and that sharing of minds. One thing is for sure, ladies and gentlemen, it's going to be great fun. You know, for those of you that like that volatility, that uncertainty, every day being different, it's going to be great fun. For those of us, for those of you out there who, who love the routine, um, it's going to be painful and it's going to be difficult. But, you know, we can achieve the success and we can reduce that pain by really practicing and perfecting those basic skills, those core competencies to PhD level. So, there we go, ladies and gentlemen. I've overrun six minutes. Um, take a deep breath. I hope you found it really, really useful. Uh, please, please, if you need any more references, because I've covered an awful lot, I've missed out an awful lot. I just wanted to give you a flavor. I wanted to really allow you to think about it. And if I've at least achieved that, it's been a success. But please email me if you have any more questions, if you want any more resources, any more references, I will certainly send them to you. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your involvement, and I look forward to um, hearing from you very soon. Thank you very much.